Hey there! In my last video, several people were amused by the fact that I had forgotten what I'd put in my kin. I will explain why, and at the same time, I will show you how I manage my firing, and why I absolutely advise you not to do as I do. But the best thing is that I show you what's on the other side, in front of the kin. So, you might not realize it because the pots are nested within each other, but there's the equivalent of multiple firing here, at least three, maybe four. Before starting a firing, I like to have the equivalent of two or three kins, so I have option when it comes to loading. As you see, I have all sorts of sizes and shapes. They are big ones, small ones, oval, tall, flat. In short, loading the kiln is always a puzzle if I want to avoid losing too much firing volume. And even then, there's often unused space in the kiln. And with the cost of energy, it's always a shame not to optimize the loading to the maximum. If you're like me, if you have the same type of production, I recommend doing the same. Wait until you have option before loading your kiln. However, what I don't recommend is having as many different types of glazes as I do. Common sense would dictate that I create series when glazing. I mean, I make a series of pottery with the same glaze, and then another series later with a different glaze. But, um, as I've mentioned before, it's crucial for me to keep the joy in ceramics. And one of my pleasures is to be surprised, positively or negatively, when I open the kiln. I need each firing to be a discovery, to avoid falling into a routine. This is why my firings are very varied, and why I use a lot of different glazes. And uh, since it can take me several weeks before putting a pot in the kiln, I often forget what glass I applied to a particular place. While some glazes are stable and trouble-free, there are others that require extra attention. Certain glazes tend to run easily, especially with pots where the glaze extends all the way down like this one, for example. With these types of pots, if the glaze might be problematic, I elevate them on small plates, like this. And the issue is that frequently, I don't remember what glass I used. And that's how we end up with disasters in the kiln, like pieces sticking to the kiln shelves. I could take notes, I know, I know, but I'm not that organized. So, when it comes to loading the kiln, like today, I typically start with the larger pieces because they are the trickiest to fit. Then I arrange the others around, trying to optimize the space as best as I can. Alright, let's get started. Sometimes I manage to figure out the organization pretty quickly, but uh, other times it can take a while. I'll fast forward through the loading process, and I'll pause if there's anything specific I need to mention. Sometimes, with the larger pots, to prevent the bottom from sagging, I place clay pieces underneath. Most of the time, just a little extra support is enough to hold the bottom. Or else... Well, this pot shouldn't pose a problem. But just to demonstrate, you can put a small amount of sand in the center. 
it will support the base and prevent it from deforming. And whenever I can, I always try to squeeze in tiles with test of new glazes. When you start making your own glazes, it's a perpetual quest for new textures and colors. It's also part of the joy of discovery when you open the kiln. So, I've created a bit of space here. A few pots are missing here and there. But you can see there's still enough to fill the kilns once more. And circling back to what I mentioned at the beginning, I focused on optimizing the loading without really paying attention to which pots I took. Now, I wouldn't be able to tell you what I put in the kiln. So, it'll still be a surprise when I open it. Hey there, again. For you, it's a transition of a few seconds. For me, it's been two days. So today, it's kiln opening day. What are your predictions? What will be the success rate? Well, I already see a very unpleasant surprise. But I'll start with the test tiles. The blue is nice, but uh, the pink one is a bit tricky to use. Worth testing on a real pot on the next fire. A black pot with texture. I wanted to create something very masculine, with a somewhat dark vibe. Something that would go well with trees with marked bark, or with lots of dead wood. A pot for a mysterious shadowy tree, you see? For these pots, it's never a good or a bad surprise. It's just what I expected. It's silly, but uh, I'm almost disappointed when things go as planned. Now, this is a big letdown. I hardly ever use a cover glaze. A cover glaze is a transparent glaze. And as a result, I don't have a homemade recipe for a transparent glaze. So, I use a commercial cover glaze. And that's the problem when you're using a glaze you're not familiar with. I should have done a test before. The glaze didn't turn out transparent at all. It gave me a semi-opaque white. Too bad. It detracts a bit from the sculpting and coloring work I did underneath. I don't know what you think, but for me, it's not at all what I expected and it's a big disappointment. But it's okay, you have to bounce back. Most of the time, when I create a pattern, I always try to make the pattern symmetrical on each side of the pot. 
like this or like that. So you can choose the side depending on the tree's direction. If the tree leans more one way or the other. Mm, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a delicate network of crackles that will absorb impurities. And over time, it's a glaze that will edge in an interesting way. So just like before, a cap on the right and one on the left for the direction. I like the different shades of this glaze, transitioning from khaki nuances to more emerald tones. You've probably gathered by now that I'm not a fan of uniformity. I appreciate that every square centimeter of a glaze is a bit like its own painting, and each side is different from the others. <laughs> but I digress. I feel like I'm hearing my art history teacher. Another cap. Well, it's a very fishy batch. And the last one. I really like the glaze. It's a very temperamental glaze. It comes out differently with each firing depending on the thickness, its position in the kin, or even the quantity of pottery in the kin can change its appearance. Hmm. It's crazy, but uh, depending on the amount of material to eat, the firing curve can vary. And that has an impact on the final look of this glaze. It's both very rich, very nuanced, but still subtle and understated. I really like it. In this case, this one is a pleasant surprise of the firing. It compensates for the one at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> 